Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Yuri Quintana. I'm an HRI collaborating scientist. And on behalf of HRI, Frame, and our collaborating partners, I'd like to welcome all of you to this event. Um, today, we're going to be talking uh, about a project that we've completed to be able to share some of the ways in which we think uh, can help improve how we develop digital mental health for youth. Um, so today, um, I'm presenting on behalf of a very large team. Um, and from that team, we have a few uh, selected uh, speakers uh, who will be joining us. Um, and so I'd like to introduce at this time, Caitlin Russell, Kevin O'Reilly, Scott, Dr. Sky Barbic, and Dr. Michael Krauss from our panel and thank them for joining us. And uh, we have also Senator Stanley Kutcher um, from Canada who will be giving some closing comments. We have over 200 registrants to this event uh, from across Canada and around the world. And we'd like to thank you all for joining uh, in this event. Clearly, this uh, is an important topic that's resonating with many people. And we wanna find ways in which we can collaborate and use science to advance uh, the way in which we deliver mental health services using digital technologies. All of this uh, is only possible because of uh, the great support and funding that we have received uh, from the following organizations. Uh, we'd like to uh, thank RBC Foundation, um, Frame, and Homewood Research Institute that have all contributed to the funding and development uh, of this uh, initiative. Um, I'd like to call on um, Shauna McCracken, the Executive Director from Frame, to say a few words uh, to the group. Shauna? Thank you, Yuri. And Thanks for having me here today. And I'm just gonna say a couple words and just to really say that as a national knowledge mobilizer, Frame is really committed and we're really driven by bringing the best evidence and knowledge to the system to inform services and programs for the best outcomes for young people and their caregivers across this country. So we're very pleased uh, to be working in partnership with HRI and RBC. We think that this work is really responding to a very critical area, very timely, especially over the last couple of years have taught us a uh, timely and critical need for our system to understand more about digital service solutions for young people. So we're very excited and we're very pleased and thank you all for being here today. And Yuri, I'll, I'll pass it back to yourself. Thank you so much, Shauna. And I'd like to welcome Dr. Sydney Kennedy, the new Executive Director for Homewood Research Institute uh, to say a few words. Dr. Kennedy. Thank you very much, Yuri. And uh, two weeks into my new role, it's a real pleasure for me um, to speak about this important work. I'm delighted that HRI, along with RBC and Frame, have been able to support this, uh, I think, really uh, valuable project uh, in youth mental health, um, bringing in your expertise and leadership in the digital mental health uh, space, which of course is becoming increasingly important in all aspects of health uh, and the importance of learning how to integrate um, digital technologies with uh, more traditional methods. So it's also a pleasure to have you uh, working on this project as an international leader. And I'd also say, like to say that I'm delighted to see that Professor Stan Kutcher, Senator Stan Kutcher, is also able to uh, take part in this uh, event. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kennedy. I'd also like to take this moment before we go further and just uh, make a land acknowledgement. I think we are all living in different cities and countries, but uh, in for many of us, most of us, we're living in lands that have been unseated by indigenous um, populations. We wanna recognize um, the lands that we are on. And we also wanna acknowledge that tomorrow uh, in Canada on September 30th is National Day of Truth and Reconciliation to com commemorate the history and ongoing trauma caused by residential schools and to honor the survivors, the families and the communities who continue to grieve for those who were lost. So we want to take uh, a moment to just recognize that. So um, uh, once again, thank you to the RBC Foundation 
that has been pivotal in, uh, in not only in this initiative, but many initiatives uh, across Canada and around the world. And as you can see on this slide, they have funded many initiatives worldwide uh, in several, many, many millions of dollars, not only in digital mental health, but many different initiatives uh, that support youth. So thank you, RBC, for all you do uh, to support our youth in many different aspects. So let me give you some context about how we got to this project. So uh, in 2020, um, with funding from RBC, Homeward Research Institute uh, started looking at how to go about systematically and scientifically evaluate, evaluating digital mental health. And from that came a foundational piece of work, which is a framework for how to evaluate mobile apps uh, for youth. And it, in that uh, document were specific criteria that uh, could be used to evaluate it. Unlike other frameworks, this got into more detailed fine-grained methods for each criteria and specified what instrument or method you could use for each of these categories, such as design, usability, privacy, security, and outcomes. In the area of outcomes, we said that you had to use validated, reliable measurement scales to measure outcomes. Uh, and we pointed out the uh, sum of the general field of what is valid and reliable, but we didn't actually specify which scales were valid or reliable. And that brought us to this uh, next phase of uh, project. And in this project, we wanted to define what are standardized outcomes that could be used uh, to measure digital mental health and which of those uh, measurement scales could be used and which of those scales have been scientifically validated that could measure those outcomes? Um, and which of those scales would be particularly appropriate for digital mental health? We feel that by identifying these reliable instruments, people will be able to do more reliable assessments of what works and what doesn't work in digital mental health. And despite that there are thousands and thousands of apps, very few of these apps have actually gone a rigorous evaluation and not all of those evaluations are using validated and reliable instruments. And so we wanted to be able to define um, which ones are those reliable instruments. Um, I wanna thank the panel members that were part of this. And we had 25 members from across Canada, um, including four people uh, that were youth and people with lived and living experience uh, that joined the panel. We also had scientists uh, and health professionals from different disciplines. And here you see um, some of their names. And on this page, you see the additional names. Uh, this group met over the last uh, six months, um, looking at the evidence and developing methodologies for identifying the best scales. And we wanna thank them. We also wanna thank Frame who organized two town halls to bring in additional youth from across the country. And here you see um, from what parts of the region of Canada they uh, came from. They met virtually and provided us feedback on key uh, aspects of what they thought was evidence and what were meaningful ways to engage with youth. So we wanna thank um, Frame for these important discussions that help us uh, develop and frame um, how we thought about this problem. Um, and from those town halls, there was some really valuable feedback that helped influence the discussion of our expert panel. Uh, here are some of the comments that came from them when we asked them about what they thought was missing uh, in evaluations. Uh, and this is just a small fraction of the tremendous amount of feedback they gave us. But you'll see that they uh, were very detailed and very thoughtful in, in their ideas, uh, suggesting that uh, these evaluations look at, need to look at all the features of the app. Um, they need to look at not only knowledge, but also long-term outcomes. Um, and they wanted to also make sure that apps were safe and didn't have harmful, harmful effects. And so, so to be able to measure long-term outcomes, we need reliable scales. And unfortunately, most of the evaluations that are being done right now are short-term. The outcomes are measured over 30 days. And really we need long-term evaluations, not only while you start with the app, but over time. So the question is, how do we then identify those scales? And so with these uh, panel members, we scoured the literature to see what uh, evaluation studies have been done and what scales have been used. 
We then um, looked for how people were evaluating the reliability and the validity of these scales. We took the input from the town halls and used them in our, uh, in our panel meetings. And the panel uh, looked at the evidence and came up with criteria for how to select the best measurement scales. And then we identified which scales uh, met those criteria. And now we're in the process of disseminating the findings. So for the literature search, we did systematic reviews of all apps that were developed for anxiety and depression and had been evaluated either in a randomized control trial or in a before and after uh, assessment. We also looked at uh, papers that looked at the quality of the evidence for measurement scales. And two papers in particular uh, were highly well done and they're listed uh, there. Uh, and we looked at what criteria they used to evaluate scales. And then we also looked at um, any uh, scales that were developed since 2018 up until May 2021 uh, to see what scales have been developed recently and what evidence is behind uh, that. From this, we found that there were 27 scales for anxiety, 31 for depression, 14 composite scales that measure both anxiety and depression, and 29 other scales that maybe measured anxiety and depression, but that wasn't the main focus of those scales. Uh, and here you see uh, graphically how all of these searches yielded. Now, of those scales that we found, the question is which ones are those are reliable and valid? And so what we need to do is sort of define what we mean by valid and reliable. And so one, one aspect of validity is called content validity. And that's uh, the measure to which uh, it actually uh, captures the syndrome that you're trying to, to measure and whether it, it's accurately uh, measuring that. Reliability looks more about the consistency or re reproducibility of using that scale um, and whether it's, um, uh, it can be uh, consistently give the same sorts of results. We looked at all kinds of criteria and then voted on those criteria that we thought were important must have criteria. And we used something called the Delphi method, a modified Delphi method. And from that, we voted on uh, these criteria. And for a criteria to be must have, it had to have at least 70% of the votes. And so all of these criteria, you could either vote for it to be must have, good to have, or not needed. And so these were the ones that we thought were must have criteria. Because we were focusing on youth, uh, it had to be a scale that was appropriate for 13 to 25. It could be filled out by patients. There had to be some uh, scientific validation studies for validity and reliability. Um, one of those tests had to be on content validity and so that it actually measured, for example, if it was anxiety for youth, that they had validated that those questions related to uh, appropriately to, to anxiety. And youth felt very uh, uh, strongly about this and the rest of the panel agreed that the scales should be completed in less than 20 minutes because we thought longer scales were uh, people would not, not likely com, uh, complete them. These other were the good to have criteria. And so one of them was that it had discriminant validity. validity. And that's the degree to which it, uh, when it measures something, um, it differs uh, on how it measures that versus other syndromes. Um, Another one was uh, inter-rater reliability, that if different people were using that scale, uh, whether um, there was high agreements with that. We thought it was useful if it was in other languages, but not necessarily um, required. Um, and then those validities, uh, when you test this, if it is translated, you need to validate it in the other language as well. Um, we also thought it was important to have prescriptive validity and that's the accuracy at identifying uh, the diagnosis. Um, and we also thought it was uh, good um, for it to have validity of generalization. And that's looking at evidence whether that scale has been tested with different demographic groups in more than one setting. So those got um, more than 70% for something that was good to have, but not necessarily essential to have. And then we went in a bit deeper in terms of uh, inter-rater reliability and test retest reliability. And there are numerical quantitative ways of measuring that. And so we looked at what were the different values that you could use to measure that. And we voted on what is the actual uh, score that you would have to have 
to be able to get um, a pass on those criteria. So once we did this, we then looked at all the scales that we had identified before and said, which ones meet the must have criteria? And here the must have criteria are in green. And you see here uh, that there are several scales that met uh, those must have criteria. In other words, there was evidence that showed that uh, people had tested those scales according to those criteria. And so these are the scales that we suggest people should be using. They all have slightly different purposes and focus, uh, but they have scientific validity that they are reliable and valid for their domain. And you'll see in the good to have uh, categories of criteria in, in yellow, many of them have uh, some of those, but not all of them. And part of this is that the science is still evolving and more work needs to be done to validate those uh, uh, scales with those criteria. For depression, we found five scales that met all of the must-have criteria. And again, they met some of the good-to-have criteria. And then um, for composite scales, we found that there were uh, two scales that fully met all the must-have uh, criteria. And these are scales that measure both anxiety and depression. Um, and of those uh, composite scales, uh, they also met some of the good to have criteria. So what are the, the summary of the finding? What we've done is identified some reliable measurement scales that can be used to measure outcomes. We found that um, for many of the scales that we were reviewing, some of them have not been validated with youth. And that's sort of an, an ongoing piece of work that needs to be done. A lot of the scales did not have content validity, and so they didn't make it into our final. And that's uh, an essential piece of work that needs to be done. We also talked quite at length about something called treatment sensitivity. And that's the ability of the scale to measure changes uh, over time and to what granularity that it can be done. The method for testing treatment sensitivity is still evolving. There are different methodologies for it. And that's something that also needs to be done so that you can be able to see how people are progressing. Um, and finally, uh, a lot of uh, scales did not have uh, evidence for test and retest. But despite the fact that the evidence doesn't exist for some of these scales, it doesn't mean that those scales may not work. It's just that we don't know if they're valid or reliable. But we do know now that there are certain scales that do meet the strong criteria and would be reliable uh, to be used in evaluation. So what are some of the implications for the future? Well, we've identified some areas for research where we can further develop some scales to make them more reliable and valid. Um, and we've developed a roadmap for that. For pro healthcare providers, you now will be able to use uh, certain scales with confidence that they have been scientifically evaluated for reliable, reliability and validity. And so what we need to do is be able to communicate to providers which scales they should be using when evaluating these digital mental health interventions. And for youth, this project benefited enormously from the inputs from youth. And I think uh, there's an opportunity to, uh, for us to continue and expand our engagement with youth so that we make sure that these measurement scales measure outcomes that are relevant uh, to them. And so uh, I'd like to pass it over to our panelists now to give their reflections on it. Uh, and then we'll open it up for, for group discussion. So some of the questions that we discussed within our group uh, that you might wanna think about is, how important is it that as a society uh, and as providers that we have a rigorous method to evaluate digital mental health app using scientific methods? Uh, where can healthcare providers go to find what has um, met those um, types of evaluations? Where is the evidence uh, that we can where do we look for that? How important is it that we engage with youth in the design and evaluation and implementation of digital mental health? And what's the most effective way to be able to do that? And how, we can, how can we as a society, both academia, private sector, governments, communities, healthcare providers, all collaborate to advance how we develop digital mental health and make sure that science plays a useful and critical role in how we evaluate implement and scale these services across the country. So that's a summary of what we've uh, done to date. And uh, we look forward to sharing more details of, of the study with you. 
and to be able to help you uh, implement it in your organizations. Um, so I'd like to now uh, pass it over to some of the co-panelists that were uh, in the group to be able to share uh, their reflections. And we're gonna start with uh, Caitlin Russell to be able to share her uh, thoughts. So uh, Caitlin. Thanks, Yuri. Hi everyone, I'm Caitlin, and I'm so honored to be a member of today's panel. I'd like to first acknowledge that today I'm calling in from Cornwall, the traditional territory of the Iroquois, the St. Lawrence Iroquois, the Mohawk, and the Huron-Wendat. I have been a youth representative on the expert panel committee created by FRAME and HRI for the past several months. From the ages of 13 to 25, I have lived with depression and anxiety. Having gone through several stages of life during those years, I've experienced what it is like to struggle with mental health as a teenager living at home, as a university student, and as a new grad trying to figure out how to be an adult. At each stage, accent, accessing mental health support looked very different based on my parents' perceived understanding of my mood, my financial status, and the amount of time or free time I had to focus on myself. In today's digital world, it is possible to provide mental health support to individuals regardless of their financial situation or their schedule. Countless companies are making attempts to provide the best mental health app, but most of these apps are created without the support of youth or professionals in the mental health field. To gain a complete understanding of the effectiveness of an app, it is critical to engage with youth, the intended user. Without engaging youth, it is impossible to accurately assess what I see as three critical questions. One, is it engaging? Two, is it user-friendly? And three, is it effective for the actual age group? If the app itself is not engaging to a given age group, it will likely go unused regardless of how effective it might be in the long term. Without testing how youth engage with the app, it is inconclusive if the language, user interface, and workflow are effective for someone at, someone at age 12 compared to someone who is 24. And without studying the effectiveness of the app on the mental health state of youth, it is inconclusive as to whether or not the app is effective for youth compared to adults. Looking at this research at an even higher level, it's critical that youth are involved in research such as this project. Youth place a different weight on factors that go into evaluating apps and digital services than researchers do. Youth are also shaped by their unique experiences, lending a different perspective to the conversation. I strongly believe that the only way to conduct effective research in this area is by including the voice of youth. To further engage with youth in these areas of research, I think it's important to go to the youth both physically and digitally. This could mean engaging mental health support teams who have clients they know would gladly volunteer for projects such as this, or working with the mental health teams at universities across Canada to find youth volunteers. To digitally engage youth, it's necessary to use the platforms that youth use. Marketing events on TikTok or Instagram, for instance, may sound silly, but these platforms are effective at reaching high volumes of viewers quickly, and youth are already using these platforms daily. Beyond logistically how to engage youth, I also think it's important to be mindful of how youth are engaged once they have volunteered. It's important for youth to understand the importance of their voice in this area of research. It is daunting sitting with a bunch of researchers who are talking about the content validity of an outcome scale, and youth need to be encouraged in a way that they recognize the importance of their opinions so they feel comfortable sharing their thoughts. Frame and HRI supported the youth and youth advocate volunteers through allyships, capacity building, and explicitly following safer spaces guidelines. At the start of the project, I was connected with an ally that consistently checked in with me and provided encouragement during meetings. My ally would reach out to me in the chat during meetings to see if I had any ideas, and then would suggest that I share my thoughts if I felt comfortable enough. Without that push, I'm not sure that I would have been as vocal. As the meetings grew increasingly technical, Frame provided capacity building sessions where they walked through concepts such as validity and reliability that we may not have been familiar with. This ensured that the volunteers could actively participate in the technical conversations during panel meetings with the researchers. And lastly, by reviewing the Safer Spaces slides before every meeting, I was explicitly reminded that my voice mattered and that it was okay if I needed to take a break and turn off my camera. This helped me open up about being a person with lived and living experience without feeling judged. I hope that my thoughts and ideas on engaging youth have resonated with you and sparked ideas of your own. I feel so fortunate to have been selected as a youth panel member for this project and to be with all of you here today. Thank you so much for the work you do. The research and efforts of those working to improve the mental health system for youth have quite literally changed my life. 
Thank you very much, Caitlin. We greatly, greatly appreciate your participation in, in this project and your comments. Uh, I'd like to pass it over now to Kevin O'Reilly to say a few words, and he was also on the panel. Kevin? Thanks, Yuri. I was humbled when contacted by Yuri to work alongside him and many other professionals from across Canada to be part of this project. Truly humbled. As a person with lived and living experience, my biggest fear since I was a teenager is that someone would find out about the dark cloud that I live under or about the suicidal thoughts that have been racing through my brain since my university years. And here, Yuri, one of the smartest and kindest men I know, said he wanted my input on this project. I don't have a lot of degrees after my name, and at first I was afraid that I was in way over my head. And that fear triggered my anxiety response, and I started to shake and sweat, and the fight or flight kicked in. I wanted to curl up under a blanket and tell Yuri he'd made a mistake by asking me. <clears throat> but my goal for the last 10 years has been to normalize the conversations around mental health and decrease the stigma. And if Yuri believes that I can be of value, then I better step up to the plate. Throughout this project, I felt very supported by the FRAME team as we learned the process and scientific concepts we'd be addressing, especially that validity and reliability. It's been a long time since I studied those concepts at university, and the FRAME team was tremendously helpful organizing sessions to teach us and answer all our questions. I feel blessed to have been a youth advocate and be a support for youth as part of this project. It was wonderful to hear their voice and what they believe is best for them, and to encourage them throughout this project to use their voice and to see how comfortable they were openly talking about, talking about a topic that was so taboo when I was their age. Through this process, process, process I learned a new acronym, PWLE, person with lived living experience, and what it means to me as a PWLE, not to be referred to as a person with mental illness, depression, anxiety, because of the stigma associated. I often say that I don't have a mental illness because I don't even have a mental. I have a brain, and let's talk about how the brain gets stuck, unstuck, and better yet, how not to get stuck in the first place. I definitely like being a PWLE. As a PWLE and a person who works with youth, my viewpoint was encouraged and supported, as was that of the youth with lived experience. Why did I get involved? As a vice principal in a large downtown high school, the majority of students I was seeing on a regular basis were struggling with stress. Many were diagnosed with depression and or anxiety, but some were not, but they were still struggling. Students knew that I openly spoke to classes about my struggles with mental illness, and that seemed to make them more comfortable sharing with me, often things they've not shared with their parents or anyone else. I decided I need to know more about how to support them, so I took the Mental Health First Aid course for adults who interact with youth, and this helped me to feel more comfortable understanding and supporting the students I was seeing. This was a good starting point, but I'm not a doctor or a therapist. I wanted to know what works out there and what doesn't work. For example, I know our child and youth workers in the school do terrific work with students, as do our social workers. I know they use a quiet room, they give the students some space and quiet time, and they had stress relieving coloring books that many of the students gravitated towards. But what was available outside the school system? I know there's some great counselors and therapists out there because our students, our child and youth workers, had recommended them to me. So I was comfortable passing those names on to parents and students who asked. There are many websites and apps that have been developed over the past 10 years, but how do we know if they really work? At first, it was other students and our child and youth worker recommending them. Then I did some research and tried a few of the apps myself, but I only used the parts of them that were free, kind of like how I use Spotify. I tried Calm and Headspace, but stopped after a while when they wanted money to unlock the next features. And were they really working for me? Then I found a simple Rain Rain app that was free and worked well for me. I just turned on for five to 10 minutes, close my eyes and breathe deeply and feel recharged and relaxed, ready to handle the next knock on my door. But would the Rain Rain app actually really be useful for the students I was working with? And are these app apps actually beneficial to youth? Are they a waste of money for those who purchase the full app? Do they potentially do harm? Do they stop youth from reaching out for other resources that might work better for them? And through working with Yuri and this team, I found out that we don't really know. So this project started us along that path. My sincere knowledge, I'm oh, sorry, my sincere thank you, the team, HRI and Frame, and all those involved for making a difference for those of us with lived and living experience, especially youth. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. I really appreciate your time, thoughts, and participation uh, in this panel and in this event. Uh, much appreciated. I'd like to pass it over now to uh, Dr. Sky Barbic. Uh, 
to share her thoughts on the project and the outcomes. Thank you. So my name is Sky, and I am calling today from the unceded ancestral territory of the Coast Salish people, specifically the Squamish, the Musqueam, and the um, Musqueamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. And I'm very, very thankful to be able to work and play on these lands. Um, and have been able to work and be a person with lived experience as well in three different provinces outside of British Columbia. And my career started in Kingston, Ontario. And in Kingston, Ontario in the early 2000s, this was really the time of transferring the system from an institutionalized system into one where we were providing services in the community and using a recovery oriented approach and moving towards this concept of providing care for individuals to live full and meaningful lives. And in my work as an occupational therapist, I had the best job in the world and was supporting individuals living in the community. But I really struggled to be able to take this fuzzy feeling that we had in a lot of our stomachs about the good work that we were doing and be able to actually quantify and demonstrate the impact that we were having. And at the same time, I had a partner who worked in emergency medicine and I was quite envious of him because he had a lot of tools to evaluate the impact of what he was doing. So someone came in with a broken ankle, he had this great x-ray machine that assessed the broken ankle and then allowed him to monitor the progress of his patients over time. And then one day um, I had this conversation with a nurse and uh, the nurse said, hey, I bet you we could take people out for coffee every single day, take them to Tim Hortons five times a day, report on it rounds every single day for a week and nobody would ask us a question. And so as a good future scientist, I took this, this task and we went out and we did this and we took people out for coffee every single day, <laughs> took our clients our caseload out for coffee every single day, five times a day. Um, and by the afternoon, I wasn't drinking coffee anywhere, I promise you that, but nobody asked us a question. Nobody said, what were you doing? Did it have impact? Were you measuring your impact? And it was that point that I really started to think about the outcomes that we have in mental health across the country and what we target and that we have outcomes that don't fit in an MRI machine that can't be easily measured and put on a bathroom scale to quantify depression, anxiety, quality of life, function. That these were outcomes that needed to be looked at much more differently and, and respected and have a science that goes with them um, to understand how to measure them in a good way. And not just measure them to get a number, but measure them to produce outcomes that are actually meaningful and can inform care and system transformation. And so that led to a lot of graduate studies and stepping out of clinical practice and to study, study the concept of measurement. And from this project specifically, it really reminded me of the four fundamental reasons for why we measure. And we measure to screen, we measure to diagnose, we measure to evaluate the impact of a treatment over time, and we measure to evaluate the impact of a system over time. And at the time early in my practice, we didn't have those tools. And this study really contributes evidence towards ways in which we can have a set of tools collectively to come together and systematically measure outcomes. But that doesn't work unless we do it all together and we do it in a systematic way and collaborate to a learning health system where we can learn from each other and learn about what works and what doesn't work. And the main outcome also for the study uh, was that for me is that this, we have to do it in this fast working pace environment. And so this wasn't a slow moving sort of community treatment team in Kingston, Ontario anymore. This is a fast moving digital health world where a number of apps are increasing every day. The number of apps that are sunsetting are, are in the thousands every day. Um, we have a lot to do and we have to keep up with the, the science of app development and digital health technology in the same way that we develop and test measures. So this tool and this study specifically brought out the emphasis um, on validity. And we talked a lot about what makes a tool valid. And, it, and as clinicians, and health providers, we often just say, oh, it's reliable and valid, it's good. Um, but there are over a hundred types of validity and, and this team specifically, especially driven by the youth, really wanted to focus on the content validity and the face validity of these tools. So they could be good statistically. And just for those of you who have a bit of math background, they're always gonna be good statistically because they found the best items that actually work together in a mathematical model. But that doesn't matter unless they actually work and they're fit for purpose for young people uh, in that context of use. And so the privilege to be able to work alongside young people and really be able to have this conversation and at times really uncomfortable conversation kind of underpinning some of the tools that we use and the legacy tools that we use really emphasizing that 
these could be good, but you still have to go back into your context and sit with the end users and the stakeholders, especially young people at, for, at, the, at, the, at the table, diverse young people, not the same people who show up to the table all the time, but diverse people uh, and make sure that it's fit for purpose. And so really ensuring that we came back to the fundamentals of measurement um, and just tie that with youth engagement and the pace of digital health technologies. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Barbic. And I'd like to now switch and uh, pass over to Dr. Michael Krauss to share his reflections. Yeah, my great pleasure. I'm uh, kind of a neighbor of Sky, so I'm um, talking from the uh, unceded territory of the Squamish First Nation. And um, yeah, I want to, uh, I'm uh, especially working in the field of. Um, complex concurrent conditions and uh, substance use disorder. So currently with the uh, overdose crisis. And um, I see that discussion we're having today as, as of critical importance because there are a lot of uh, things happening and a proper understanding, uh, a proper assessment of uh, outcomes and um the the needs variety of needs is critical to be able to respond effectively uh, so uh, assessments uh, are a very dynamic field they are it's not you create something and it's there forever um it has to cover the different needs appropriately what a lot of assessments are not doing and it has also especially to in uh, identify uh, the uh, treatment paradigms, which are driving also the assessments. So um, it's a dynamic field, which means we need to establish also ways to validate them. And that's what this uh, project is about. And it also needs to better cover things. So I'll give you one example, which I find impressive, and it leads me also to my next topic, is uh, the prediction of suicide or suicidality. We are not very good with the current measures to identify the, the risk of suicide and the likelihood of a suicide attempt. But given the new um, possibilities of new technologies, uh, we are able to provide new test uh, ways of test delivery, like associated tests and 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 things we are doing in neuropsychology quite some time, which are much more predictive. But all of that needs to have a conversation about treatment paradigms and or um, framework of, of, of mental illness and uh, to validate what we're doing in order to create dynamic and learning system for the future. Um, so my main take home message would be yeah, let's use the let's use the discussion about assessment also to uh, validate what we're doing on a theoretical background um, and uh, talk about treatment paradigms and monitor what we're doing more effectively and as a routine so that we are able to uh, respond to uh, changing needs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Krauss. And so I'd like to open it up for questions from the, the audience and you can please put your questions uh, in the chat area uh, or you can uh, raise your hand. There's an icon up on the bottom right. Um, one question did come in as to why we didn't do eating disorders. We talked about different uh, conditions and um, and because of time limitations, we decided to narrow the scope of which conditions were going to be um, included. Um, but now that we've gone through the process and probably at least half or two thirds of our time was spent on trying to define what we meant by validity and reliability and how to scientifically measure. Now that we've got some clear definitions, at least within this uh, uh, panel group, uh, those criteria could be used to then search for other scales and then find whether there has been published evidence um, that, to test the validity and reliability using those criteria. So I think um, um, more work 
could be done, should be done, so that we have um, reliable, um, reliable instruments to measure these uh, outcomes. Uh, so uh, please put in your questions, uh, put it in your chat. Um, I'd like to pass it over also maybe to have um, uh, Travis, Dr. Travis Steinert, uh, who is, um, was sort of a, a co-lead on this project on the um, frame site uh, to maybe share his uh, reflections on the projects as the questions come in. So, Travis? Yeah, hi, thanks, thanks, Jerry. Uh, so I see one question coming in saying that it was uh, very uh, fantastic to hear from uh, Caitlin, who was, who was on the outcome panel and, uh, and uh, Caitlin, who also asked the question, was asking how many people uh, were, were, were part of this, how many young people, uh, people with lived, been living experience were part of this pro process. So uh, we had two uh, representatives, people with lived and living experience on the outcomes panel itself. Um, uh, Frame supported them throughout the process and uh, they were linked up with allies. And then, uh, uh, apart from that, uh, really a lot of the engagement occurred during the um, during the town halls and focus groups. So during the the town hall, uh, the first town hall occurred prior to us even finding out, you know, what what skills were validated and really helped to inform what the committee, the outcome panel, was looking at. And then the second um, town hall, which is more sort of focus groups happen towards the end to see sort of what's what's next about this the whole process. So um, yeah, hope that that answers your question. The frame team was exceptionally good at helping us um, in developing the use strategies and um, to be able to en engage with them. And I think um, they provide us a lot of foundational methods and strategies. Uh, the town halls also have a rich amount. Uh, there's a report that uh, from the town halls as well, and uh, there'll be subsequently that information will be available on the HRI and Frame um, websites. Uh, I see a question from Dr. Roy Cameron: Could this lay the foundation for creating a kind of learning community developed similar to uh, networks such as Cure for Kids, which was done by uh, myself and some colleagues in pediatric oncology? And certainly I think there's an opportunity now as we start developing not only the methods for evaluation, but um, doing these evaluations with these reliable instruments to be able to share that knowledge. And so both for uh, a community for researchers to learn about effective methodologies to implement uh, would be useful. I think for healthcare providers as well, what are the uh, ways in which you can deploy these services and do it in an intentional way that you collect the data to help evaluate it. Doing this at scale requires training, it requires support, it requires methodology, it requires governance. There's a lot of implementation science and operational knowledge that needs to be done. Um, and we shouldn't be reinventing the wheel across different cities and countries. And so uh, I think communities of practice would be in a, a great way uh, so that we don't reinvent um, um, these, um, these efforts and we can learn from each other. And that's what happened in the pediatric oncology community and they were able to share best practices and evidence and implementation. Uh, and that's uh, something that I think could happen also uh, within Canada. And I think this project in itself was a reflection of that. We had 25 people from across Canada come to share their collective knowledge. And so I think there's the collaborative spirit in Canada to be able to do and I think Canada could be well positioned to, to kick off a community like that. Um, I see there's a, quite a few questions coming in. Um, yeah, there was a, another question about uh, how we ran the focus groups in town halls and uh, you know, I don't have time to really go into detail about that right here, but I'll just say that there's, there's a, a big recruitment process. Um, Frame has a um, a program called Groundbreakers in which youth advocates and caregivers can join. And so calls went out to this, to our Groundbreakers network, uh, in which case we, 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 um, we found people who were interested in this opportunity and invited them out to, to the town halls. But uh, this will all be documented uh, in, uh, in a process document along with the findings. And that will be sent out to everybody when that's, uh, that's completed. So if you wanna find out more about how we specifically did them, did the town halls and focus groups, that will be there for you to, to, to take it and learn from it and use. So uh, Kiri Garo has asked a question about, uh, speak about uh, the racial and social economic diversity in the project. Um, and 
intersectionality. Um, I think there are two ways we could look at this. One, I think in terms of the panel members, we had a, a diversity of disciplines, genders, uh, orientations, and, and cultural backgrounds. So I think we were, we strove for that. Um, it took extra work to sort of have a, such a large panel and a little challenging to organize it, but I think we benefited a lot from learning from each other's disciplines. So I think I would highly encourage to do that. That requires more time and funding to do, but I think we greatly, greatly benefited when we're trying to understand different definitions of how we viewed validity. Um, I think in terms of the evaluations, one of the, uh, one of the criteria that we had is, has it been tested with different social economic groups? And I think some of that is actually quite lacking, that we don't know enough about uh, the populations that they were tested in terms of cultural, language, uh, gender, breakdown of the people that were used in the studies to validate that. More needs to be done. Canada is a very multicultural country. Most countries are becoming more multicultural. And I think understanding the appropriateness of these scales for others, and especially on the heels of tomorrow being um, uh, a special day in, in Canada, doing this for indigenous populations and understanding which scales, methods, and, and methodologies are appropriate for them, I think is a, a really needed aspect um, of that that needs to be uh, done done more. Um, so um, I know the questions are coming in, uh, but I, I know we have uh, Senator Kucher with us and he, I know he has a, a hard um, uh, deadline that he needs to drop off. So I'd like to call on him to share his reflections on what he's um, seen and uh, today and his thoughts, Dr. Kucher. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Yuri, and uh, I'm coming to you from Nova Scotia, which is in the unceded uh, territory of the Mi'kmaq peoples. And I'm an independent senator, um, which gives me tremendous freedom to nudge uh, without having to uh, get all involved in political partisanship. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the great work that uh, Homewood Research Institute has done and uh, welcome your new director, my old friend, old being, we've known each other for a long time, not we're physically old. Uh, uh, Dr. Sidney Kennedy, uh, be a great uh, future for, for HRI with Dr. Kennedy there. And to acknowledge uh, the, 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 the wisdom and, and, and the, 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 the thinking that went into all the comments from all the panelists. Uh, it's a privilege to be uh, here with all of you today. My apologies for having to leave uh, immediately. The, the, the issue that, that, that you're dealing with is one that has not just national, but uh, global implications. Uh, there is uh, much discussion now um, about uh, not just uh, digital uh, approaches to healthcare, but uh, the, the way that these uh, approaches uh, can be provided so that there is comfort that they meet the needs of the population and that uh, they are utilized in ways that are more helpful to people than uh, not helpful to people. The issue of apps uh, has uh, percolated to really near the top of that discussion uh, with the realization and the growing realization that um, although many apps have traditionally been used for entertainment purposes, apps that purport to address mental health and health uh, are, not, are not toys, they're tools. And so the issues that we have to think about uh, and the way we have to think about these apps is very, very, very different than the way many people have thought about apps before. And so what you are doing is you are helping through the work that you're doing focus our thinking in a very, very different way. Now, I just want to reflect on, on two um, components that come out of um, mental health and health-related apps. And I'm going to speak about them as health-related apps because they, they fit together with the same paradigms. They're marketed and they are sold as both diagnostic and therapeutic products. Now, that matters. They're not there as, as something to play with. They're marketed and sold is either diagnostic or therapeutic products. They may use words such as wellness, or they may use phrases such as mental health, or they may use words such as anxiety or depression, whatever words that they use, 
they still market themselves as diagnostic or therapeutic or both products. Now, when we talk about what that means, uh, that means that they have to have some evidence of effectiveness. They have to have demonstrated utility. And I'm really glad, and Caitlin, you talked a lot about this, how important utility is. Um, and they have to be safe. And I just want to raise an issue here that safety is not just lack of adverse events, but safety extends to the data that is collected with all these apps. And my colleagues and I are becoming increasingly concerned about the safety of data that is being collected. And I would urge you as you go through your further deliberations to spend time focusing on that. Those of you who have not yet read the book called Surveillance Capitalism, I would highly recommend the reading of it. And those of you who aren't familiar with the impact of Grindr and the sale of Grindr to the Chinese government through a Chinese corporation and the impact that that has had on global economic and political decision-making, I would urge you to make yourselves familiar with that as well, because this is not an innocuous issue. Uh, and needs to have a lot of very careful thinking through. Now, in order to, to have comfort that these apps are going to be helpful to people or more helpful than not helpful, there are two things that need to be done. One is there has to be substantive, solid, excellent research. And I want to thank Yuri and your group for, for, for moving in that direction. That is really, really important. The research must be independent. It, um, independent of the industry and independent of the people that are selling the tools. And it must have end users involved in it from the get go. And this is a wonderful model that you are, are showing us how to actually move the research forward. The other part, however, is the regulatory part. You know, the, uh, there, there is actually in our country a, fr a regulatory framework that addresses products that purport to be diagnostic or therapeutic. And one of the things that we will have to grapple with is regulatory frameworks. So regulatory frameworks can only be as good as the evaluation, the components that go into them. So that this is going to be something that we're going to have to go hand in glove over the next couple of years to try to achieve. Now my office is going to be taking a lead in looking at uh, mental health related apps and mental, mental health related electronic uh, approaches um, within the regulatory framework to assess out what is actually possible in Canada and where these regulatory frameworks can, can, be, can be thought of and where they may, may be directed. So listen, I just want to thank everybody uh, for the incredible work that you're doing and your leadership in this. Uh, this is uh, essential. There is, uh, I'm going to underline, I'm going to say it again, this is essential work to do. It has to be done at the highest quality. It has to be done independently and with end users involved. Um, and I look forward uh, to hearing from all any of you who are interested in the regulatory discussions we will be having over the next year or so. Uh, and again, to thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to join you, to, to listen to what you, the great work that you have been doing. And uh, we will look forward to a brighter future for, for, for all Canadians uh, because of this work. So thank you once again and uh, bon chance. Thank you very much, Senator Kutcher, for um, those insightful and inspiring uh, words. Um, and um, um, we want to thank um, all the participants. This work was done um, through funding through these nonprofits and um, was free of any commercial bias or, or influence. And I uh, concur with the center, the need to have good evidence based on good science, free of uh, conflicts of interest. And so uh, thank you for those um, important words. Um, and so um, I'd like to thank all of the groups who are coming up at the close of uh, the hour. And uh, maybe I'd like to uh, just uh, ask uh, Dr. Kennedy and, um, and Shauna McCracken just to maybe just say some closing words um, as we close out. Uh, Dr. Kennedy, if you'd like to maybe just say a few words. Thank you, Yuri. Um, as I was listening, I was reminded of um, work that's been done 
in the Toronto Rehab Institute over the past decade. And you may think this is a real non sequitur, but very quickly to test winter boots, to test their safety on slippery conditions with a floor that could be tipped at 30 degrees or uh, certain levels of, uh, of oil put on. And at the end of that research work, which was really done with the safety of the elderly in mind, the investigator, the scientist ended up being asked to put a rating on the boots in terms of their safety. It turned out that the, the safety of the boot had virtually nothing to do with the cost of the boot. So my, my sort of summary comment is I do wonder if you and others uh, could see a time when you could actually put a rating on apps in terms of the various measures of usability, which I think would be tremendously informative to uh, users. Thank you, Dr. Kennedy, and we appreciate you joining HRI. And I think uh, some of this work can help contribute towards the generation of those evidence. Um, and as we move forward, we're going to have to find ways not only for the academic community to generate, but translate this to, to nonprofit groups that are at the front lines of this. And so I'd like to just uh, maybe ask uh, Shauna McCracken just to give a closing comment. And her organization is a fantastic network uh, of networks, and she is her organization is connected with many of these nonprofits. Shauna, if you'd like to say a few words. Thanks, Yuri, and it's been a great presentation and uh, so lovely to hear from all the panelists and for those who have shared their lived experience with us today. I'm always grateful for that and I think adds a critical component to uh, what we're trying to learn and how we're trying to build new systems of service for young people. So thank you for your, for your stories and your expertise. And I think one reflection I have, Yuri, is that obviously the work that's happening here is very timely and very critical. Um, there's also a quality of service piece that we're trying to achieve here as well. So it's not just doing something, it's doing something well and doing something with integrity and purpose and impact. Um, and so I think that I've just been really inspired by our panelists today who are all, all experts um, doing amazing work in this area, but with the level of integrity uh, that I think we really need to be able to sort of push ourselves into the next service system for young people and caregivers that truly is around excellence um, and enhanced outcomes. So that's my re reflection from today. And just very grateful for everybody's reflections, expertise, and thoughts. Thanks, Yuri. Thank you very much. Um, and so uh, we're at the top of the hour. So I just want to thank everyone who has participated uh, in the events. Um, you can email your questions to, I'm sorry if you didn't get to all of your questions, but you can send your questions uh, to the email address that was on the website and we'll, we'll respond to you. Uh, we will be posting uh, this recording um, on uh, YouTube and uh, we will be announcing it both to the people who participate and signed up when it's available as well as the report uh, and announcing it through our social media um, channels. So thank you again for uh, the collaborative spirit and collegiality and the sharing of knowledge that we've had. I think we had a, it was, a really difficult but really fun uh, process to go through. I've met many new friends along the way, and we hope that we can all as a community stay engaged together, working to advance mental health and particularly for our, our young generation. So thank you. And this brings us uh, to the end of our summer. Have a great day. <laughs>